drink or any such thing. Thank you, Kinga. Thank you, Kinga, for introducing uh, this, uh, this second group workshop. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, good morning. Uh, you have a good uh, evening. And uh, also good morning to anyone who is watching us over our live stream. Um, today I won't start as my usual um, anecdote uh, kind of a start of the presentation because I have so much to present to you. Uh, today and uh, I have a little bit of a danger of falling behind uh, the time which we don't want to do. Um, so today I will be presenting uh, part of my preliminary analysis of teacher learning in innovative uh, Portuguese schools. Uh, this is part of the teacher learning in innovative uh, learning environment uh, research that I'm doing and I nicknamed it's so far because I'm, I'm just in the middle of, or maybe at the beginning <laughs> of the analysis, so I nicknamed it Unfreezing Pedagogies. Mm -hmm. um, this is within the framework of learning teacher, and just to give a little bit of, um, of a visualization where my, my research sets, if, if we think of the EDITA as a large framework, the European Doctorate of uh, Teacher Education, uh, this is a consortium of five universities, ELTE is one of them, which has its own little framework called the Learning Teacher. And this, within this framework, the Old that's my research. Um, so, so I'm one of the 15 within the inner circle, but I'm also a part of the beat uh, of, of uh, ELTE. And um, my research focuses on uh, two countries. So this is a two case study uh, research of Hungary and Portugal. Uh, for today, I would like to brief you with a general overview of my study. Most of you don't know much about it, which I'm very glad, because I'm, I'm also glad to hear your impressions of it. And I would like to also brief you on the starting analysis uh, of my Portuguese case. As, as I said, this is a very preliminary analysis, so you will have to be patient with, with me being at the very beginning. Uh, later on, uh, well, not in this presentation, but afterwards, uh, we will have some uh, discussion. So I, I always like to start with the context or the contexts, because there are many contexts. And context is in the core uh, of, of, my, of my research. It's also in my title, the context of curriculum reforms and developmental interventions. And uh, this means that I don't choose top to down bottom up in interventions. They're both uh, equally represented in my, in my research. And, um, but what I do want to stress is that um, there are <coughs> studies that do um, talk about successful uh, implementation of, of reform, successful implementation of uh, developmental interventions, even if they're going uh, bottom to top. And uh, for instance, ACIS, uh, they have uh, made us this very nice presentation of, um, of how the intervention goes through different layers. And this can be applied from uh, having a governmental me uh, uh, measure to uh, applying it to the school. And if we think about the attaining level, so what is the learning experience and what is the learning outcome? So we always need to think about uh, of, of lots of layers when we talk about uh, the context and when we talk about curriculum reforms and interventions because there's what is written, what is the idea, what is then uh, perceived by the teachers, what is then perceived by the students through how teachers do their curriculum, and then what is the learning outcome. And these might vary a lot from the beginning to the end. Also, we have Snyder and his group uh, who, who said that within curriculum implementation, we also need to think about who's playing what kind of role. And already here, and I won't go in details through this, but already here we can see the role of teacher changes in each of these three perspectives. So we can have the teacher as a passive recipient of a measurement, of an intervention, and uh, who is just transmitting the concept. 
And we have, in the curriculum and outcome perspective, a joint effort of the learners and the teacher uh, to enact the classroom experience, to create the knowledge and, and, and so forth. And this connects us very well with teachers. And teacher learning as part of my uh, topic, uh, as a, possibly the core of my topic, um, is, is, is very present and I use a conglomerate of different perspectives to give some kind of my own um, definition of it as a type of professional learning that goes beyond continuous uh, development, continuous professional development, and involves complexity, the level of tacit knowledge, the uh, number of implicit and sometimes unconscious learning outcomes, and uh, if we talk about learning, we have to talk about the outcome of it, which is the knowledge. And Cochrane, Smith, and Lattel, uh, Lattel? Um, they talk about three types of, of, uh, of teacher knowledge. And we can also see a slight gradual complexity in this knowledge for practice, knowledge in practice, and knowledge of practice where uh, knowledge for practice might be something that is happening in this institution where uh, an explicit set of knowledge is given and passed uh, from uh, one side to another side. And then we have knowledge of practice, which is this something that I've already mentioned, this tacit, very implicit kind of uh, knowledge that teachers have when they actually do their practice. All of these, th th there's no favorism between these three, but all of these are very important, and this again gives us the layering of the topic that, uh, that, that I'm, I'm dealing with. And finally, um, if we want to uh, talk about how learning happens and, and what uh, we mean by knowledge sharing, Beckins did a, Beckins and the group, they did a very good study of teacher learning in innovative learning environments in Netherlands, and they said, uh, well, it has to be active and self-regulated. And it also goes mainly through uh, exper experimenting and reflecting of one's own practice. But it goes through doing your own job, working with parents, working with teams, um, solving problems and challenges, and also doing extra uh, curricular, extra content work. Um, if we think about why some teachers were, uh, are more keen of learning and why some are not, we can think of uh, Koch who says that if we want to achieve sustainability in learning, especially among teachers, this happens when teachers are engaged um, as uh, engage, have uh, an engaged practice as uh, moral beings. And this goes again into a, a wide, um, a range of complexity that I actually don't want to enter, luckily. Finally, just a few words about innovation. Innovation is not an educational science invention, so it doesn't come from education as natural. So I have to borrow um, a little bit of definition and a little bit of, uh, of ideas from, from elsewhere, especially in the commerce world. Um, and innovation, and I've, I've, I've chosen this O'Sullivan's and Rogers uh, definition, because these kind of, if we, we translate it into education section, it makes, it can make some sense. So it's a process of making changes and adding something new to the organization, uh, some, uh, adding a value. And Rogers says it is an idea, practice, or project that is perceived as new. So it not necessarily needs to be new, it just needs to be perceived as new which is valuable for, for us in, in educational context because na national context and sometimes even school context makes a big difference. So something that is an, a common uh, practice in one context, in, for instance, Finland, might be perceived as new in Hungary or in uh, uh, Lithuania or el elsewhere. So this is a very, very valuable point here. And in education, that can be through technology and digitalization, through teaching approaches and methodology, through architecture, use of space, and of course through organization of work, including external and internal collaboration. So, and this is not extensive because I try to be comprehensive here, but this is not extensive because 
innovation in education builds and builds. <laughs> it's unstoppable force. So how am I, uh, in my crazy mind, uh, attempting to do this? I've opted out to do a qualitative research approach uh, by using nested case study. And I, I like this idea of nested case study. Uh, I like the idea of case study, first of all. But I like, it, I like also the nested case study approach because it is a study that is using a scaled approach and it's traveling through uh, macro, meso, and micro level in order to gain a comprehensive analysis uh, at, the very, at the very end. Um, Stake and Miriam both say that um, uh, in education, case studies are uh, quite good um, methods to use to study complex um, uh, research cases and to uh, gain a holistic and comprehensive analysis. So I followed these great minds and uh, I hope I will uh, get somewhere with this. Uh, as for my, my data uh, collection, I have um, chosen to do interviews and some of these interviews are actually interviews in a focus group setting, especially with school teachers and school teachers among all of these groups will be the largest group because the topic is teacher learning so um, I wanted to see their self-perception of um, how they learn. I will also um, invoke specific do uh, country documents, uh, for instance policy measures which are obviously very important and also uh, from the large documents to small documents which are for instance study plans and with individual study uh, uh, individual, individualized learning plans for students and so on. And I have something uh, as unstructured observations. I haven't structured my observations because the topic of innovation is just unpredictable, especially in context where I don't understand uh, maybe the, the language, I don't understand the, the country itself, for instance in Portugal, but even here. So this is, this is kind of the setting. So let's go to increasing pedagogies, my Portuguese case. And I start uh, layering this case as I, as I like, um, again, I like this metaphor of Matrioska that, uh, that has different layers and, uh, and you maybe start from the very big layer. So as, as in, in this case as well, I start, I start with the very big layer. So I, I've actually got um, consulted some documents and I, I had uh, some interviews with the ministry and in the ministry it was a very interesting conversation that we conversation that we had and some of the some of the um, quote that I liked very much was this one how we see it the goal is to individualize and differentiate learning and teaching in school to unfreeze the pedagogy that have been stuck uh, that we have been stuck with since the 19th century. And this uh, instantly gives us a setting. Uh, so this comes as a, uh, an official saying this, this gives us a, 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 an interesting setting. I like the metaphor of, of unfreeze because it seems that something is not flexible enough, something is a little bit um, icy and we need to break it a little bit, we need to make it a little bit flexible. And indeed, in the Portuguese context, Currently, this is how the educational success is perceived. And I won't go into all of these because it would take too much of my time, which I uh, don't have. But if, if, if I would go into this, I would present a very complex, quite comprehensive um, um, uh, array of measurements that the Portuguese government has uh, impl uh, is implementing at the moment. So for instance, political program is for the adults. So the parents who are, have, have no qualifications because the success of the learners, of the students, is correlated with the um, uh, level of education of, the, of, the, of their parents, especially the mothers. And this, this was done through studies, and this is, uh, this is what they also have. Uh, in particular, these two um, interventions are prepared to be bottom up interventions, so, so they are um, uh, pilot projects that go from the school level and they should in two, 
to you from now um, um, uh, generate some kind of uh, knowledge, some kind of learning for the other students. So, so, so not everything is top to bottom. Uh, as I said, I won't go into specifics of, uh, for these conflicts because I would like to actually show you the innovation spectrum. Show you the innovation spectrum, uh, which I uh, which I have seen in uh, these selected um, uh, of these schools, um, and they were selected because they were um, they were innovative in one way or another. So I what I've seen is, for instance, and this is all all, all examples. For instance, no bells, no classrooms on Friday afternoon, no textbooks, and this came, for instance, as an uh, an answer to a. Um, problem that they had, for instance, with kids being late for school, or with having too much violence on Friday afternoon, um, teachers working in pairs of teams, uh, cross-disciplinary subjects, for instance, a subject called water, which has disciplines of biology, geography, and history inside. So three teachers, three subject teachers working together in a class called water. Um, Switching to consummative to formative assessment with no end of the year grades. This this was this blew everyone's mind. Community involvement, which means community of local community and uh, our parents and so on. Self-directed learning plans of the students. So students are given a whole curriculum that they know for the whole year, and they need to self-direct their learning with help of uh, coach teachers. Storytelling and yearly narrative. There are schools that actually do a whole story that goes throughout the year, and within the story, uh, different subjects are, in, uh, are put inside. And three uh, layer, three layer project based learning. And this, I as I say, it's uh, at the beginning of my analysis. So I classify these into these three categories at the moment. But this is again a non extensive list because. Uh, only yesterday I returned from my last data collection from Portugal, so this might actually expand. And what about the very, very um, middle of the material of the bit? Um, the teacher learning spectrum goes from rethinking the curriculum, uh, understanding the perspective of learners or the, their students, understanding themselves as learners. Some schools actually identify that Student, uh, that teachers are as same as students. So not everyone learns in the same way. And this is a valuable, valuable understanding. Uh, managing the, the new goals, understanding the context uh, that we live in the 21st century, that it's very, un, that we don't know what the future brings, and um, connecting with students at various levels, so as mentors, as teachers, as coaching role and engaging with creativity and professionalism. And I could identify the what of the learning spectrum, the how and the why. And if we thank you, and if we think of my my theoretical background, we have all of these um, already laid out, for instance, how uh, the the back end study of experimentation and reflecting on own practice um, and 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 so on. Now, now, my analytical framework is still in the making. Uh, prior to, uh, during my, my first set of data collection in, uh, in Portugal, with my colleague, we managed to develop this uh, nice flowery shape of school development, where I identify teacher learning as very significant element, which goes together with other um, three uh, perspectives. Now I'm adding a, a two new layers, of well, three new layers, the teacher learning itself, the element of the learner, and the context of why. So why do we need to change this practice? Why do we need to learn as teachers? And this goes both for country and for the, and like the world. So we're now in 21st century, so we need these kind of, uh, these kind of uh, things. And the country, uh, especially when teachers are uh, understanding that, uh, that the, for instance, in Portugal, we need to move forward because in Portugal we have uh, 
50 years of early, um, early uh, dropouts um, uh, in school, so we need to set up. And, and this is the this textual part. I believe my time is, is over, so I will close with this. I hope I didn't bombard you with too, too many information, and if I did, uh, well, I hope you will take the notes that you want uh, for, for yourself, and I hope this will inspire a good um, discussion. Thank you very much. So, um, my topic is pre-service teachers' perceptions about their initial teacher education. And um, I'm just like Helena, an Edita Project uh, member. And um, well, the presentation you're going to see um, in, a, in a big part is uh, unchanged from, uh, from the summer. Um, because what I'm concentrating now did not actually uh, present a lot of presentable things. But I, I did change a bit in the end, and, um, and you will see what I'm going to focus on. Well, for some of you who have already uh, uh, seen this, uh, the focus will be uh, in, uh, in different uh, areas. And so my initial thought entering this uh, process was uh, what interests me most as a higher education specialist is quality of higher education. How can I um, approach quality of teacher education, initial teacher education as is? And so where I um, uh, went with that was the problem statement. Uh, so looking at in what way initial teacher education programs uh, prepare or educate uh, these students for the complexity of the teaching profession. So there are many ways how to look at it, but the complexity of the teacher, teaching profession is definitely uh, one of the main reasons why teacher education is not an easy thing. Why teacher education is a complex uh, matter um, this, this, the reason why initial teacher education programs are really, really hard to measure or, or look at um, uh, are, are, there are many, but the most important ones that I, 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 um, I see are, the first one is inside the, 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 the structure of the program. So there are not many or ever at all other um, higher education programs where so many different departments, institutions, and even totally different um, um, fields have to work together. So in teacher education, if you want to be a math and physics teacher, then you have the math physics departments, you have the methodology departments over there, and a totally different faculty of the university will teach you psychology and uh, pedagogy, and another completely different place will give you work experience, or multiple work experiences in many different schools. Um, all the people who work with you there have very different concepts of what a teacher is, and here I am already at the second part of it. So. Uh, the aims of the stakeholders, what kind of person, what kind of teacher, what kind of professional I want to see in the education system is really very different. Um, there are maybe countries where this is something that, uh, that, that was part of the public discourse, not in Hungary and not in Portugal as I know. So there is no actual communication between the different stakeholders. The government wants something. The, parents want something completely different than the children or the students themselves. Um, but also there is a, a certain element that comes with the actual participants of the program, the, the student teachers who arrive to the university with very different expectations, but also with very different knowledge base. And we know that um, we create um, our 
knowledge and our professional identity based on what we already know, what we already experience. And, um, well, the idea that the students who arrive to become teachers have already about 10,000 hours of experience looking at teachers doing their work. Um, and so they have a very concrete uh, vision of what kind of teachers are good and what kind of teachers are bad and what these teachers are doing and so what they should be doing as teachers. So this is a fundamental challenge of the initial teacher training programs uh, to change it um, if necessary into, uh, into ideas that are um, much more um, or much closer to, uh, to the uh, scientific uh, understanding that we have on what a uh, teacher should be. Uh, but of course, all different uh, stakeholders would want to change these students into something completely different. Anyway, um, I am also going to do case studies, uh, just like Helena. And, um, and my focus is, is the student. Um, what I'm interested in is what the initial teacher education programs that I'm looking at in Portugal and in Hungary uh, mm -hmm. looks like or feels like or perceived like from the inside, from the student. Um, it is just as well interesting and important to know what the, uh, the teacher educators think about the program that they are working on. It's just as important to see what the uh, authorities think about the program. But my understanding, my interest lies in what the students think. And this, I feel, is one type or one interesting reality of the program, a perceived reality of it. Um, so, so what are the students' perceptions and what they think uh, about their uh, programs? And uh, this, these are how my research questions are formulated. Again, they are about perceptions about the profession and about how this perception changes. And, um, and so my wish and aim is to understand the inner workings of the program, and thus the quality of it a little bit, through the concepts of the, the student teachers on their own improvements, on their own becoming a teacher, on their own professional identity. It's a little bit of a back door into, uh, uh, into the case, but I want a much more narrative approach. And, um, and so I'm not preparing to ask really direct questions on, you know, on the quality. And definitely not about is it good or is it bad. These are, these are not really useful things specifically because um, uh, being satisfied really depends on so many factors <coughs> that are outside the control of the program itself and, does, and says nothing about the program. Says much more on your own expectations of it or your own expectations of yourself before getting into so I'm not going to go that way. I'm going to go into seeing what the, the student teachers uh, think about knowledge, competence, and what factors influence these views. Um, and uh, all the important information, I hope, will come out of these narratives. Um, and, uh, and the second question is also very interesting because it goes into the complexity issue that, uh, that is basically today one of the, the core concepts about teaching um, is, is how teachers cope with this comp uh, complexity and how they are getting prepared to cope with the, with the complexity, um, knowing that there is no way of getting ready um, uh, completely. Um, there is a myth about teachers getting out of the university being prepared to teach that is not what is happening, and it is not really the wish. They need to be prepared uh, to start working and continue developing uh, into competent teachers. 
So I'm doing these multiple case studies on three levels, just like um, Helena, but I'm not doing the nested version of the matryoshkas. My uh, macro and uh, meso levels are more to give me a context. My focus is really on the micro level, on the students themselves and on their perspective. But anyway, um, um, it was felt that, that, that the context is really valuable, so there needs to be um, uh, document analysis of all the macro and, uh, and meso levels. So just a little bit about what, uh, what Lisbon and, uh, is about, because you all know a little bit about Hungary. Um, and since I am still not finished with the, the, um, the actual um, uh, questionnaire and interview uh, um, instruments, so this is really a preliminary um, um, thing of what, what I already know, is that there is an interesting uh, dynamic that will probably come out in my research about how the Bologna and the post-Bologna system that we have in Hungary um, is, um, is fundamentally different. And uh, the ideals of this, these systems, of what is or what could be amazing in the Bologna system and what could be amazing in the uh, five, six, whatever, how many years uh, uh, fully un united system, and of course, what the present the situation is, and how these systems' flaws uh, automatically brings, uh, brings interesting um, uh, problems uh, into view. So this is a Bologna system in Lisbon, uh, where the, a couple of uh, contextual issues uh, makes it very, very stressful. Um, so, um, how it's done is that the BA has really no educational uh, credits in it. So in the Hungarian BA um, um, in the Bologna system did have a 10 uh, credits requirement to get into the Masters of Education programs, which gave at least a little bit of an insight for the students of what the teaching program will uh, bring. Uh, these students had nothing, they just had to do their generic uh, BA, BSc in whatever subjects they want to teach most. So this is just one subject, BA, that they do. And then during the MA, they will get the minor uh, and all the pedagogic knowledge that they can cram into the two years. Um, and so the decision to become a teacher comes much later, and so there's no real experience in school until the fifth year of their studies. So if it turns out that uh, being with children who are unruly or whatever, they are just shouting your name all the time, is not something for you, it comes quite in the late of your uh, studies, which is not really helpful. Um, so until the fourth, fifth years, there's no uh, opportunity to grow as a teacher, and the ex examples that uh, they have at the university are still no uh, better than the, or even maybe worse, as teachers than the ones they met at the high school level. Um, and the MA program uh, also faces, uh, you know, harsh realities. In Portugal, the diminishing number of students in the country happened at the same time as the country started to uh, gave, give more work hours to, to teachers, a little bit like in Hungary, uh, and raise the level of the years of uh, pension. The three things together made it so that there is no jobs. For the past 15 years, there are basically no opening jobs in the Portuguese system. And, um, and so in the last five, 10 years, the numbers of students who apply to the MA of, of teaching diminished also rapidly. So on the program, the program still exists, uh, but many, many of the students in the program are in their second or third degree. They want to, uh, to have new subjects to teach, uh, to promote their uh, job opportunities. But even if you do finish, um, your chance of getting hired really matters on a point system. The point system starts Every year, it starts with your final mark of the university, and then with each year of practice experience at a at the government school, you get one extra point. So as you get older and more uh, experienced, your points are getting high enough that you can 
you know, be sure that you can get to the school that you want to go. But every year, they basically rotate all the teachers around in the country. Um, it is a very interesting thing, and um, and uh, maybe innovation-wise, it is interesting to uh, to have an idea that your teachers, about a third, sometimes even half of your teachers, will be somewhere else next year, and you will have new teachers. So maintaining your innovation is a challenge, but at the same time, the innovation that these two teachers had experienced in your school will be multiplied in other schools if, if it was successful and these teachers get there and uh, they can plant seeds. I don't know if that happens, but, uh, but uh, Helena surely will find uh, examples for that. Um, but at the same time, um, this is extremely stressful and specifically if uh, there are uh, teachers with families, uh, one year to the other, usually only the very last days of August you find out where in the country you're going to live for the next year. So that is extremely stressful. It is not something that, uh, that, that people uh, really want to live like, so that's, that's not, very, not, not very nice. Um, and I am also, like, just to uh, get to where I am right now, I'm still working on a lot of scientific background, reading a lot on a couple of interesting issues because my focus is so much on how professional identity changes, how professional knowledge develops, these questions are really, really important to, uh, to conceptualize well. And some, some of my colleagues are really ve well into their uh, concepts and, um, and models that they use, I know I'm not. But, um, but there are some interesting uh, models that, that I found. Um, uh, one of them is how professional identity um, really develops against other identities. So professional against lay. So how am I different from all other people in the, in the world as a professional? Professional against amateur. So how am I different from all other people who try to do what I do, but I do it professionally and they do it uh, in an amateur way? Um, then professional against technician. It's very interesting as a teacher. How am I different from people who are just going through the curriculum, whatever is written, I do it in a technical way, not really thinking about what, I, what I'm doing, not really trying to improve myself, just do it as I'm told. This is a technician. And sometimes the governments really would love to have teachers that are technicians, and some teachers who would create all the curriculum as the government would want it, and then I could trust that everybody's going to do exactly like that, exactly at the same moment. Uh, but that's really not how a professional uh, teacher is thinking. And, and the fourth level is professional against academic. So an academic would really concentrate on creating new knowledge or, or looking at and finding out new um, connections between things and, 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 and learning things. Whereas a professional would do that in their practice, but still concentrate on practical issues. How do I put this into the most effective practice that I can uh, create? So, um, uh, so also thinking about professional knowledge in this sense, how what I know institutes part of this understanding of, of my profession. Well, this, this is where I am with that. Um, I'm not sure this is uh, where I will stay. That's why I didn't really uh, put it concretely there. And a couple of dilemmas that I, that I brought. Um, so, um, I was still thinking. I was still thinking about uh, how directly I can uh, uh, question the quality of the program and how uh, I was advised against that. But uh, but but that was still still something that I uh, that, that I'm wishing. Um, and um, until I get my results, I'm, I'm not going to know if my uh, actual interviews will bring enough information about uh, my, my really uh, wishful um, aim. Um, I love focus groups, and um, I was really thinking of uh, bringing that element into, uh, into this uh, research design, but I'm not sure. Um, and this was something, again, that was not decided yet. And um, 
And there, there are ethics questions all around. People are really freaking out about ethics, and I just do not understand what kind of ethical dilemmas I face here. I don't see any. I, I, I always just think that uh, I keep it anonymous, I keep the, the, the data unavailable and secure for everybody, I, I make uh, changes in the names and the stories so that nobody is, uh, is recognizable, and I thought that's enough. But, uh, but, but still, many, many issues of ethics was uh, brought up in our community, and so I was, I'm really open to anybody's suggestions if I face ethical challenges that I do not see. I'm, and um, well, I had this motto that uh, teachers need to have their cake and eat it too. It seems like uh, there is no part of teaching profession that is simple, that you always need to uh, be in, in, in all parts of the dilemmas, whatever is facing. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>
Um, well, reading on a very basic level is decoding symbols, right? Decoding symbols and making sense of them. But it goes a bit deeper because uh, a comp it is more like a complex cognitive process where you derive and construct meaning from a text. Uh, you have to be very careful to be able to read out the information that is actually in the text, but don't superimpose your own expectations or your own beliefs and read into the text. So it is a dynamic interaction between the reader and the text, so it really requires practice and some conscious knowledge of how to do it. And to be able to successfully process information, it has already been proven in the past that only direct explicit instruction leads to the maximum development of reading strategies and to the maximum uh, reading efficiency. And, uh, well, this seems to not happen. This is what all that I can say based on my research that first year students still seem to lack this uh, knowledge. So what we can do is, uh, well, we could blame the teachers, we could blame the system, or we could just, you know, fix the problem. We get them at their first year, so we have to fix the problem here. And actually universities, I think most universities in Hungary offer some form of academic skills classes where they actually learn how to read effectively. But to be able to build uh, a good curriculum for these classes, we need to actually be aware of what's going on while somebody is reading. And there are, there is a multitude of uh, reading models, but none of them are validated. So actually, uh, I think this is where my piece of research can come in as a starting bit, a tiny starting bit, for hopefully a big uh, array of future research that I would like to actually focus on the process. And how can you focus on a process which is completely internal in somebody's mind? Well, it's very difficult, <laughs> let me tell you that. But I think that uh, traditional reading tasks like multiple choice reading tasks are not appropriate because they don't give the students a big enough freedom. What I found is that summarization tasks might be a good way because in summary, they have to read the text and get the gist. So to be able to get the gist, to be able to summarize something, you have to fully understand it. And there are two different types of summaries. The global summary, which actually is when you read the text and you want all the main ideas presented by the text, and there is the guided summary. Now, for example, the text is about teaching online, and it has, uh, the first part is about the history of teaching online, the second part is why it is good for students to learn online, why it is bad for students to learn online, and the last part is about how the teacher is affected by teaching online. And in the guided summary, you would have to extract only, um, for example, extract the parts which refer to uh, how teachers are affected by teaching online. So to be able to, this is even more difficult than a global summary, because in the global summary, if you are practiced with reading, if you are a practiced experienced reader, then you can detect, usually by the, if they have placed in the text, the main information, the key information. But here you have to really go deep into the text, read it very thoroughly to be able to select only the relevant pieces which answer your question. So this is why in my study I use guided summaries to check how students are processing information. And these are the, well the main research question was how do they read, but this is very abstract so I had to somehow break it down and I did. And I don't expect you to read all of them so let me summarize it for you. So the first to refer to what characterizes the first year students' reading processes before and after getting a half a semester explicit instruction, aka the academic skills class. The, four, uh, the third and fourth research question refers to um, what are they including into their guided summaries, what kind of information, if they are including the relevant pieces of information or the extra pieces of information that are relevant for the task. And the last one is, how does 
or does language proficiency level of participants, the participant influence their reading skills and their development, if it influences at all? So these are the main questions I want to find answer for. And to do that, uh, I am actually looking at a group I am teaching. It's of uh, 14 students. And uh, while they are all Hungarian native speakers, I, I really intended to do it so because I wanted to minimize all the other possible effects of other uh, mother tongues. And I am looking at uh, this autumn semester. Um, so I am looking at their development through this semester. But I, as I cannot really do a proper longitudinal study in half a, semester, in half a year. What I am doing is, uh, well, it's a, it's a qualitative approach, but I am collecting data on two occasions. And uh, the first occasion was the beginning of the semester, right at the beginning, so the first week, uh, and the first three weeks, actually, because 14 students were two hours in clouds, it was impossible to do in the first week. But it was the very beginning of the semester, and then I'm going to do the second data collection at the end of December, so at the towards the end of the, the semester. And during the first uh, class when I met them, well, imagine how good it is to meet your teacher at the first university class, probably for some of them, and I handed them a placement test. So I am not the finest teacher. So uh, I did most for placement test with them, which has the grammar part and the listening part. And I also added a Pearson academic reading test because the placement test didn't have anything specific for reading. And I thought that based on the topic of the research, this would be very important. So uh, this was administered on the very first class. And then uh, from the next day on, people kept coming one on one. And uh, we met for a longer interview. And in the interview, uh, it was a think aloud. The think aloud uh, means basically that uh, the person sits down, does the task, and while doing the task, uh, he or she verbalizes all the thoughts that come to their mind. So, um, so they did the think aloud, uh, think aloud task on, uh, on a guided summary writing task, which I developed earlier. There were two guided summary tasks, and I'm going to uh, develop them uh, to um, administer them in a counterbalanced design. So one student gets task A, the other student gets task B, and again task A, task B. So they kind of, I try to avoid them to discuss it among themselves. But both of these guided summary tasks about, are about topics that they can be familiar with. So it's very general, historical, women's right movement topic, one of them. And the other one is about learning and uh, learning in childhood, learning languages in childhood. So they are very uh, simple topics, and the tests are, uh, are approximately on a B2 level, so it should be appropriate. The think about procedures were uh, developed based on the um, advice I found in Bowers 2010. And after uh, all these think alouds are recorded, audio and video recorded, uh, and at the end of the think aloud, I also sit down with them right after the think aloud and we are rewatching parts. Well, I initially I thought that it would be ideal to, to rewatch the whole thing, but nobody has that amount of time because one think aloud takes around one hour, one hour, ten minutes, <laughs> because they have one hour for the task. I fix that. But before that, we also have a practice phase when I give them some, just, uh, just simple sentences to, you know, jump on sentences they have to put them together by verbalizing their methods. So nobody wanted to sit through that. Honestly, I didn't want to sit through that. But um, we are rewatching specific parts. <laughs> and uh, then we do a retrospective interview on it. So uh, in those interviews, I ask them about their previous uh, experience with such tasks. Have they ever? met such tasks, have they ever got any instruction, any similar instruction like this that had anybody ever told them about giving strategies before? And they are also common people why they did this or that when they were not able to verbalize it during the task. For example, when they were reading, it's very difficult to verbalize for them. So um, this was the first phase, and I expect the second phase to go down exactly the same way, hopefully. <coughs> And uh, in my data analysis,
analysis, but I am going to transcribe all the collected data and first I am going to subject it to content analysis. And this is what I already started. And in the content analysis, I am looking at the use of reading strategies, mostly, and actually what are they doing. And I am coding this based on a coding scheme I have already developed for another pilot study uh, that I did in a very similar topic during my early PhD, like first year, I think. And, uh, well, I will adapt it as, as needed, but that uh, taxonomy works very well in such cases. And I am also going to uh, use propositional analysis on the final, the final guided summaries to make sure uh, that the differences between the first final guided summary, so the, final, uh, the guided summary is produced in the first phase and in the second phase, uh, the amount of information included is really obvious and uh, the quality of information. So I would like to look at that with propositional analysis, how relevant the ideas are. And how do I define what is relevant? Is uh, I am going, I already piloted these tasks and there is a preset con uh, list of content points. So task relevant pieces of information from the task. And that's what I am going to look at if they are present in the guided summaries produced by the students or if other pieces of information are there. And those texts were uh, piloted with, with five people. So yeah, so this is why it's, I think it's, it's valid to, to look at it that way. And what are my expected outcomes? Well, um, definitely I would like to get and I hope to get a deeper insight into what actually underlies the reading processes, what actually happens when somebody reads for academic purposes. And also, um, I think it, these are important to be able to, to develop a good curriculum for the academic skills classes. So let's see what we are uh, working with. And, uh, but also, I would like to check myself what are the actual effects of instruction. Uh, and this is uh, what one of my dilemmas is related to, that what extent should I talk about in my dissertation, uh, that talk about the specifics, what happened on each class. Because I am looking at somehow the effect of instruction, but I am looking at indirectly, because I, I don't take notes about it every single week. For example, it's not a proper longitudinal study, it is still a cross-sectional one. So this is why I am puzzled here to what extent include what about my classes. And the other dilemma is of course that I am the teacher, so how can I ensure the objectivity uh, when it comes to specifically this question, the effect of instruction. And also uh, what is interesting and has not very well researched yet, what has, has not been very well researched yet is uh, the effect of language proficiency on the uh, development of reading comprehension, so uh, this is why I did the placement tests. And I have students from uh, various different proficiency levels. And I, I would like to see if, for example, C1 level students improve more during one semester than B1 level students, for example, or B2 level students. Because uh, that is a big question. If so, then probably we should focus on improving the language proficiency of the students in general. But my personal hunch based on previous pilot studies is that language proficiency has not much to do with the, uh, and based on the preliminary data analysis, language proficiency does not really have to do a lot with their reading skills. So um, this would be very interesting. I think, uh, yes, that's, that's all uh, I wanted to tell you uh, at the moment. I don't have more yet. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, thank you very much in advance for all the comments and questions which can bring me forward in this research. Thank you very much. I'm a guest here as well, but a very happy guest. And uh, I'm also very happy to be here for the second time because I feel this uh, as a unique opportunity to show you my the current state of my my uh, research uh, project 
my dissertation project. And uh, last uh, semester, when I was here, uh, I tried to uh, sketch out my um, theoretical background of the dissertation project I'm conducting. So I'm not going to go into very deep details of the theoretical background of uh, the literature view. I will share bits and pieces of it, but I'm not going to go into details about that. Uh, Fortunately, the topic is the same, <laughs> which is uh, I think is very important because I'm a second year uh, doctorate student here at ATA, um, at a very early stage of my research, uh, and I still have the original topic I have chosen <laughs> at the very beginning, so I feel myself lucky. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, your research colors. So uh, the topic um, I have chosen and still the same but is the reflective practice in mentor-teacher and teacher training relationships in additional teacher um, education. And um, uh, I've chosen this topic for several reasons I haven't uh, talked about last time. Um, I have a very strong motivation to explore uh, this field of initial teacher education. Um, I have personal dedication as well. Uh, I'm a teacher and a, mentor, a qualified mentor teacher. And uh, as an experienced mentor, I feel uh, the ups and downs, the twists and turns uh, of, of this uh, mentorship pr program. And uh, somehow I felt it has a way to improve uh, that. And uh, I'm also aware of the fact that there has been structural and systematic and also contentious changes in uh, initial teacher education that has touched the force. Uh, the mentorship program as well. Um, just to mention two of them, um, one of them is that the, the mentor uh, certification became mandatory for teachers who support, lead, follow, work with, etc., etc., uh, with novice teachers in the pre-service and in-service period. And the second uh, one, which is important to us, that the whole structure of the mentorship program has changed. It has three, three stages now, uh, two in the pre-service uh, period and one in the in-service period. So they, they spend quite a lot of time, mentors spend quite a lot of time uh, with their mentees uh, on site. And, um, and I also saw that there, have, there are potential uh, possibilities for improvement, not because the system is not good, uh, only because it, it's pretty young and uh, I feel that there are gaps uh, within and in uh, the system. So when I was preparing for this um, workshop and for this presentation, I thought it would be good to just show you where I am now, what I'm planning to do, and what uh, besides I'm finding I'm already having um, in my pocket. So um, when we, and I very often use first person plural because I work in a very strong collaboration with my supervisor, um, Dr. Dorner. So when we uh, started to plan our research design, we thought it would be very good to conduct a pilot research in order to orient our thinking about the whole topic we want to uh, explore. And um, especially we wanted to see where are those, um, where are those focus points um, in this whole topic we really have to uh, test uh, in, a, in a large scale surveys. So for this, in this pilot research, we, uh, what we really did is try to find focus point for a large scale survey we are going to uh, conduct within the dissertation project. Uh, we are going to um, conduct this large scale survey well, yeah, large or, or medium scale survey. We did 200 and uh, to 300 uh, mental teachers in Hungary. Uh, we are not planning to ask more because uh, we see that um, there are about 1,400 uh, active mental teachers in Hungary now. Um, another. Uh, another point of this uh, research design is a longitudinal study of mentor mentee self reflections. Uh, we are going to conduct this. We are still doing it with 10 mentors and their mentees. And um, we just uh, decided to make interviews with teacher educators or program directors, which is still a question doing with the interviews with uh, either with teacher educators or program directors in seven different institutions um, in Hungary. 
And just during the pilot research, we thought that it might be useful to do uh, a qualitative study in focus groups of, of the student teachers in the Hungarian institutions. So where we are now, we have uh, already done the pilot research I'm going to present now. Uh, we have started to design the large case survey questionnaire. Uh, we are in the process of doing the longitudinal study of mentor mentee self reflections. Um, I can't go into details about that, but maybe uh, in the later stage of this workshop I can. We started to get in contact with, uh, with universities and institutions uh, uh, where teacher educators uh, are working not only on uh, mentor trainings, but also where they uh, work with uh, uh, novice teachers. And uh, we have already started to plan the focus group interviews as well. So about my pilot research. Um, this pilot research uh, and the results of this pilot research have been, have been uh, presented in uh, some uh, conferences during the last semester. And we did this um, um, because we wanted to see what's the reaction uh, to the results, and we try to uh, find uh, the most interesting points uh, in this pilot research. Uh, I'm not going to uh, tell all this, but you can see it uh, on the screen. And now I'm going to show you a really an encapsulated version of the preliminary findings of this pilot research, which is going to be, hopefully, going to be published um, in uh, one of the uh, international journals called the uh, Mentoring Institute in Partnership and Learning. Okay, so <clears throat> of course we had uh, research questions in our mind before we started the pilot research and um, we kept the most uh, centered ones which is uh, uh, about the concepts of mentors, about the mentoring process and about their mentoring roles in this process. So we wanted to know how teacher mentors working in IT conceptualize mentoring as it is. And connected to that, um, we felt uh, very important to know more about their reflective practices because what we saw that uh, their concepts are mainly realized in their reflective practices and mentoring strategies uh, they use. And we also wanted to know, because we found there is a way to improve, how they are related to adult learning models and uh, the student autonomy. Um, and just uh, very briefly about the theoretical background, I promise to you that I'm not going to go into deep details, but I just want to share uh, a model with you, which is uh, from Rain and Jones. They, uh, conducted an empirical research about an ideal, how an ideal mentor is, what, what is he or she is like. They asked mentors and mentees in 1997. And uh, what they found, uh, it's very important to mentees and mentors as well to sympathize, uh, to be sympathetic to gain students' confidence in, uh, during the process. They also found that um, the sense of humor is a very important ingredient of the mentorship, not, of the mentorship, not only of the mentor's a sense of humor, but also the mentee's sense of humor is a very important ingredient. Um, they also found that for mentees, it is very important uh, that their mentor is always approachable. They can turn to uh, him or her in, in each and every case they need help. And um, uh, for mentees, it was very important that their mentee's page, mentor is patient and tolerant uh, during the process. These are all the ones which are the characteristics of the mentor, uh, but the, uh, for, and uh, they are defined by the mentees mainly. But it is also very important that the mentor uh, is um, in a con is a is a continue in a, is in a continuous professional development in his or her career and always stimulated by new ideas. And uh, he or she is always motivated and wishing to develop in his or her career during the mentorship and outside of the mentorship as well. The mentor should accept uh, his or her own failings during the process and outside of the process as well. And uh, what uh, is very interesting to us, 
that um, it became a core uh, characteristic that the mentor should show humility committed to the pupils and also to the students in the process and being tactful. As you can see, it's a kind of, uh, it shows a kind of partnership um, in learning that a mentor should be a partner in, during the whole mentorship process. Um, you can even imagine that it's a, it's kind of a friendship. Of course, it's, a, it's nothing to do with emotions, but still, it's a very nice image, I think. <laughs> okay, and what this all shows is that um, mentoring processes have their own benefits in initial teacher education, and the literature proves the same, that it has a, a very positive impact on the outlook of the teaching of the uh, novice teachers, and uh, why is it important to us? Of course, because we want more and more novice teachers to stay uh, in the profession. And uh, a good mentorship, uh, a good process of mentoring has a very good impact on teacher retention and uh, minimizes the turnover uh, during the process. I also tell, told you that uh, reflective mentoring practice is an important role uh, in the mentoring process and in the concept. We found this very important uh, also because um, it was very difficult uh, for the mentors to express their concepts uh, in words. Uh, so what we found is that usually we traced their uh, conceptions in, their, in the expression of their, when they express their reflective mentoring practices. Uh, we tried to define a reflective practice uh, according to Cortegan, uh, who said uh, the uh, reflective practice is an instrument by which experiences are translated into dynamic knowledge. And uh, it seems that it's a very crucial uh, point for, for the mentees, because uh, a good reflective practice of mentoring can improve confidence, self-esteem, uh, self and the ability of uh, problem solving during the mentoring process. And of course, it helps them to become a very good teacher. And not only the, the mentees can become a very good teacher, but at the same time, a good reflective practice improves the, the mentor teacher's practices as well. Um, in the Hungarian system, um, mentor teachers have specific, uh, specific reflective responsibilities during the uh, process. We can even say they are compulsory. Um, compulsory points during the uh, process, but they are, we found that the, they are not very important when we, when we are talking about the real concepts of mentorship. And we also wanted to see how these reflective practices are connected to adult learning, and within adult learning, we wanted to know how these reflective practices support the mentees to become uh, self-regulated learners. And, uh, we also found that in the Hungarian system, uh, self-regulated learning is an important element of uh, initial teacher education, uh, which is kind of obvi obvious. Uh, but what is more interesting than in the system, uh, it should be achieved by developing uh, reflective practices. In the models of adult learning, um, reflective and self-reflective practices are always very relevant, and uh, they constitute a, a cycle of learning uh, which we used in, um, in uh, designing our, our uh, research, uh, the large-scale uh, study. And we also found a very strong interconnectedness between self-regulated learning and the continuous professional development uh, processes. Um, it's a very complex um, uh, topic. Uh, I can't uh, share more details, but if you are interested, we have already had a, a paper published uh, on this topic in the village to the land. Oh, which is very good for <laughs> It's just a very happy thing for me. A very, uh, <laughs> yeah, I feel it's a success story. Okay, so about the um, uh, pilot research. Uh, we used semi structured interviews, uh, interviews in this pilot research. We made interviews with 10 um, mentor teachers, uh, seven women and three men, which is kind of representative more or less in the, in the Hungarian uh, teacher society uh, from different uh, disciplinary fields. Um, these interviews were two hours each at least. Uh, so we had like a 20 hour long um, data collection 
and we use a qualitative approach within the phenomenographic uh, tradition to analyze these data. I can't go into detail about the phenomenographic approach, maybe, sorry, Dr. Rauch, maybe later I'm <laughs> going to do that. So what we found uh, in this uh, pilot research, we find a mutual agreement about the importance and meaningfulness of the mentoring and the responsibility to professors. So all the mentors agree of the importance of, um, of the mentorship. They even said that they wish they had a support like this. Uh, it, almost each and every interview they said that they, they wish they had this kind of uh, support during their career. Um, another finding uh, which uh, helped us designing uh, the whole research structure is a serious contradiction between the self-conceptualization of mentoring roles and their practical realization. Uh, very often they express they cannot live to the expectation. They know what an ideal mentor is like, but they just feel they, they can't do that. They are not able to carry out the duties and all the uh, workload they have. Uh, so what they do, they pretend to be proper mentors and withhold the information about their difficulties uh, in order to keep their spotless image. Uh, to the, in, the teacher, in the teacher community within the school, and towards the mentee as well. Um, or they can, um, or they express their difficulties and they are very honest with their, with their mentees and they keep on complaining about uh, their uh, having workload and time constraints. Yes. Uh, and uh, connecting to the, uh, referring to the adult learning uh, part I've already mentioned, uh, what is very striking for us that uh, they kept on uh, calling uh, novice teachers as child, boy, girl, and sometimes they mention them as students. Very rarely they use colleague, novice teacher, or any kind of labels that, uh, that express uh, partnership. Uh, there is also a tendency for supporting self-regulated learning and student autonomy. It either starts with a, a highly alternative uh, reflective practice and goes to a collegial uh, partnership towards the end of the process, or sometimes it happens vice versa. Sometimes it stays from the very beginning as a partnership, or uh, it stays as an alternative learning pro for the whole process. So there are various tendencies we uh, uh, perceive. And why they want to uh, motivate, why they want to support um, uh, mentor teacher, the mentees uh, to be staff regulated learners. Um, actually, it's um, a very um, uh, down to earth motivation uh, because they want to balance the clash between the theory and practice. Uh, they want to reduce uh, the workload on themselves. So they just push the responsibilities to the mentees to do their own job, to do what they want to do and how they want to do. Uh, the third one is that they want to prepare them to uh, launch a teaching career right after the mentorship. So they just want to prepare them for uh, an immediate uh, uh, start of their career. And uh, another reason for, for uh, supporting self-regulated learning is that they don't have information about the mentee's knowledge before uh, the mentoring program, so they just let them do what they want to do because they don't know what they can do. Uh, conclusion, and just very quickly, we <clears throat> we have uh, four categories of interest for uh, the large scale survey uh, that uh, we got from this pilot research, and we want to uh, ask, we want to know more information about. Uh, the first one is the time perception and how the mentors can uh, manage their time to dedicate more time to their uh, mentoring work. Uh, the second one is uh, we want to know more about their role concepts, how they really conceive of the, the concept of their mentorship roles. Uh, we want to know more about the tribe mentoring relationship between the teacher educators the mentors and the mentees, and if they, if this triadic mentoring relationship can help improving uh, this mentorship program or help supporting the uh, adult learning dynamics in this uh, program. 
And we also want to see, because we saw that there is a need for a community of practice, if there is a, any possibility uh, to involve these mentors into virtual or real, real platforms of sharing ideas in the community. Okay, very detailed. And thank you for your attention. If you have questions, I'm very happy to answer them if I can. Thank you very much.